Hey, Brandon, it's Quinn. You are all set up and streaming live now. Awesome, thank you. Cool, let's see. All right, welcome everyone, whether you're live or whether you're watching the recording after this. Um, my name is Brandon Ruiz. I'm one of the fellows of the uh, Charlotte chapter of the League of Creative Interventionists, um, which on a bigger scale outside of Charlotte, um, is an amazing organization that I'm really excited to be a fellow with this year, uh, along with a couple other amazing people who all have endeavors and projects basically put together to um, create creative intervention within communities, um, using the arts, using vehicles like um, what I'm doing with herbal medicine, with farming and whatnot to um, create change within those realms and within our communities. So um, really excited about some amazing things I've been doing with them this year and will continue to do this year. And um, including these talks that I'll be doing over the next couple of weeks throughout the month, um, throughout the month of May. I know I'm doing another one on the 20th and another one on the 27th, 27th to 26th, don't quote me on that, but um, which you know I'll post more about in the future so you can see exactly um, what those will be. So yeah, today I want to talk about um, starting an at-home garden. And that is something that has been, I think on a public level, really, really important, uh, very vocalized about, I feel like in, in this current time, especially. Um, and I'm noticing personally, a lot of people are coming to me with questions, um, wanting to find out you know, how to do that. This year so far, I've, I've helped start more gardens than I ever have, I think maybe collectively, but in one year, in one season for sure. Um, so there's a lot of interest in it. Um, it's something that is in people's heads a lot. And um, yeah, so I figured I would just kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, I'll give a little background on myself so y'all can kind of understand where I'm coming from and uh, my experience with this realm of work. So I started a project here in Charlotte, North Carolina about two years ago called the Charlotte Herbal Accessibility Project. And it's a project that I created to basically provide equal and affordable access to herbal medicine and um, in every form of the sense. Um, and looking at communities of color, looking at lower income spaces within Charlotte, North Carolina, um, and basically spreading that knowledge, right? So the project operates off of five different pillars or sections. Um, and that those also tend to be things that reflect my personal life in ways that I believe in and um, things that I do with my work. And so those five are regenerative action, uh, which is shown through the projects, um, basically how we look at when we're farming, we're doing regenerative farming, right? We're not just doing sustainable farming. Uh, but we're moving forward and regenerating and teaching and you know creating more spaces um, so that what is going on with this work that is creating you know spaces for herbal medicine and urban farming um, is expanded right so regenerative action is the one um, food security obviously we're looking at addressing that uh, within our communities in charlotte north carolina health and nutrition right consuming fresh and um, high quality produce and foods, um, obviously, you know, organic, beyond organic, really. And let's see, what is that? Um, health and nutrition, food security, regenerative action, um, racial justice, and looking at the history of food cultivation, especially with communities of color, um, how we look at the past and acknowledge what's gone on and how we move forward and build off of um, what we have and what we can do and cultural preservation, which has become a very significant part of um, the work that I do over the past year, especially in looking at cultivating culturally significant plants uh, for the communities in Charlotte. You know, there's tons and tons of different communities from all over the world here. And, um, you know, focusing in on that and finding a way for, uh, you know, how do we connect with plants and how do we connect with what farming is, right? So when you, uh, I was finding that, you know, I was never really growing this sort of stuff, but I see, you know, you bring somebody something, oh, we're growing lettuce, we're growing greens, we're growing beans, uh, the sort of broad sense of what gardening is. Um, and it's kind of like, oh yeah, that's cool, you know, urban, you know, they have a garden. Um, but when it gets into culturally significant stuff, right, when we're not just growing 
greens, which is no offense to greens and, and broccoli and whatnot, but you know, we're growing root crops, we're growing uh, yuca or cassava, we're growing sweet potatoes, we're growing beans from different parts of the world um, and reconnecting people with those parts of their culture. Uh, it becomes really important and the work becomes much deeper than that. Um, and that's something that I've experienced personally and I believe that everyone could benefit from greatly. So that's kind of just a little bit on me. Um, and I've been doing things with plants for about six years or so. Um, and I've studied throughout mostly this region of the, the country and then in the tropics and the Caribbean and um, in Costa Rica specifically in Puerto Rico as well. So um, kind of starting with the, with the basis of this, um, you know, concept, like starting a home garden, right? Like I said, it is something that is in the forefront of everybody's minds. Um, and with good reason, but a lot of the things that people are starting to realize as the world does what it does, I'll just say, um, as the world does what it does, you know, a lot of people in the world are starting to realize these things like, oh, I really want to make sure that I have access to my food. And of course, it's situational, like I want to avoid my time in the stores or going out and doing things like that. Um, but even beyond that, you know, looking at our food security is something that's really important. And actually the um, one of the other classes I'll be doing on um, one of these live talks is going to be on food sovereignty and that concept of that and um, all about what food sovereignty means, right, and why that's important. So people are realizing, oh, I want to be sovereign over my own food. I want to be um, able to grow certain things. And, you know, people are, maybe some people see this as an opportunity to say, I'm going off the grid. I'm going to grow all my food, you know, but other people um, are just finding that it's really important to have a connection, even if it's just a smaller thing, even if it's a couple plants in a pot on the patio, um, and what exactly that means to be connected with nature in a time where it seems, uh, you know, things can be very closed in, not only like metaphorically, but, you know, physically, like staying home and not being out all over the place, right? So it's a perfect thing to be doing. Actually, the garden in my personal house, this is my first year with a complete season, um, living in this house and you know me and my roommates created one over the past month or so so now you know I have this going on and um, there are a lot of different capabilities we'll talk about with space with gardening but we'll, we'll get to that because you can do it you can garden wherever you are so um, growing a garden is something that I like to give the the background of it as something as sort of a reminder right um, when we think about farming and we think about gardening, um, I think a lot of what goes through people through people's minds is very transactional, right? It's very uh, this Western sense of how we relate to nature and how we relate to plants. We want something from them. We we grow them. We dominate them uh, to be. <laughs> that sounded intense, but you know what I mean. Like I'm basically, we're trying to push ourselves as this overarching of like, I'm going to grow this, I'm going to plant this, it's going to give me what I want, you know, that's that. Um, and when we look at that in a holistic sense, it's, it's very, that philosophy is very far off from how we should be with our relationships that, uh, first off realizing that, you know, this nature and plants and everything is, is part of us, right? We come from the origin of where this all is. It's very easy to think that we're not and kind of see a separation between those because of the state of the world and how we're very, um, you know, in this state of not really in a solitary state, but we create this very big concept of individualism that separates us from the world around us, right? Um, and so I think it's really important to realize the philosophy, 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 philosophy behind uh, urban gardening, urban farming, and growing your own food um, is that this is a relationship that uh, is very organic with plants, with the soil, right? And that doesn't mean that you have to have a huge yard or a giant scale production of stuff to be in touch with the soil, uh, but you're creating life, right? So it's different than, you know, having a child or something to that note, but in a way, you know, you have like a little child you tend to and you help it grow. Um, you learn about plant communication, right? You learn about how does a plant tell me oh, I really need water, oh, it's really too hot. And a lot of it is not some other, um, you know, really complex language. It's very easy for people to say, oh, that plant doesn't look very happy. You know, it wants something. So learning the language of plants is something that I think is really important. 
um, and it's not difficult. The concepts, you know, when you say that to someone, like, oh yeah, like I, I know how to communicate with plants. Like, mm, okay, you know, this one, you can talk with the plants, right? But having that sort of communication with plants is something that's very organic um, and that we as humans have the ability to do. And it's not in some complex way. It's really looking at how plants grow, looking at, you know, the needs that they may have as we cultivate them and as we work with them. So um, just really tossing aside that mindset of overarching our relationship with plants and with farming and gardening that we are in control and that we do whatever we want. Um, like plants won't take that. You know, I've, I've had some gardens been put in for people over this year and at other times and people can get really frustrated. Um, and for me, like growing things, not everything I plant grows, not everything I plant wants to be there, um, wants to grow in that specific place. And again, that's part of the language of plants is being like, hey, I don't want to be in the sun. I want to be in the shade or I don't want to be in the dark. I want to be in full sun, really hot, you know. Um, so it's a very unique language and a very unique relationship that we can start to build with plants, uh, with the earth and in turn with ourselves. So I think that's something really important that I like to start off with, you know, is to realize that this is all um, a conversation, right? Well, this is a community conversation. You know, it's a conversation with um, the plants, with the soil and how we relate to it as our food, right? And our medicine. So when we think about having a home garden, I also like to start off when I talk with people about it. Um, and this can be really specific, right? If someone is um, having me create a garden for a community, having create a garden for them, like a, you know, a, a couple or a family or an individual person, I really like to ask what their intention is. Um, so I'll kind of take myself, well, I'll keep myself in the situation at first for the example of saying, like when I ask someone, what do you wanna do with this, right? Do you want this garden to be a community space? Um, do you just want to grow some stuff for yourself? Do you want to grow this as something that you want to, you know, um, take a hold of and have this overarching, um, how would I say, sort of role in distributing and educating and things like that? Um, there's a lot of different ways and aspects to having a garden or having a farm or whatever. I will say garden, it won't go up into farm, right? Um, so, Actually, wait, before I go off on that, I, I like to say farm and I even like to say urban farm because when we look at the concepts of the word farm um, and also the perversion of what farms are, right? A lot of people only think of, oh, what's farm? Um, a farm tends to be in a lot of people's heads. Maybe this is just me. Um, well, it's not anymore, but I think at one point in my head, it was some guy is on a tractor in a big field of like one crop, like corn or soy or something like that. And he's riding through and, you know, that's the, what farming is. That's what food is. Um, it's alien. It's, it's something else. I don't have to worry about it. It comes from somewhere else. It gets to me. I don't worry about the process. That's that. Um, and so when I say farm and I say I'm a farmer and I'm not a gardener, I try to challenge the concept of, of what people say when they're like, hey, you know, or not really say, people don't say like, hey, you're a farmer, you know. Um, I try to challenge that concept of what a farmer is because in our society, I think that what we call a farmer is something very different. And again, like I said, with various crops, uh, we're not just growing, you know, salads and, and spices, right? The farms, as a farm, we are producing something that is um, like its sustenance, right? And to what scale, that really just depends. I mean, the main space that we're working with, um, with the project and on the east side of town here in Charlotte, North Carolina and Noda is like a little less than a third of an acre or maybe a third of an acre. It's really tiny, but you can do so much within that space. So um, I like to challenge that, like say I'm a farmer and I'm growing, you know, we're growing beans, we're growing root crops, we're growing really dense things, seeds, stuff that actually sustains us and is not just kind of like side dishes, you know, not to go down, you know, go crazy on collard greens and everything because collard greens is part of the staple, right? It's all part of the same thing. So anyway, um, so yeah, just having that intention when you think about putting, having a garden, um, what is your intention for it? Do you want to connect with plants in some way? Do you really not want to go crazy and have a bunch of stuff? Do you want to have a handful of spices? Um, do you strictly want to just have spices, right? For cooking, 
or do you want to be growing stuff that you can save? Do you want to save seeds? Which personally, I think, you know, everyone, if you're doing some sort of seeds or gardening, you should do that. Um, but thinking about what your intention is for it, if you do want it to be something that is um, long-term for, you know, the community or education or anything like that, then there are different steps that I feel like you would take getting into that. So when, let's see, I think that's kind of a, a good summary. Um, just having your intention, right? And thinking about why you want to garden, why you want to have some sort of thing. It doesn't need to, if you feel like, oh, I only want it for blah, blah, blah. Like there's no level of wanting a garden that is unacceptable that you shouldn't have a garden. Um, it's just something to jog your, you know, your thought process of why you want to do it. And maybe that can help motivate you to do certain things once you are growing food um, and where they go or what you do with the, the plants, right? So the way that I like to think about evaluating and thinking about um, starting a garden, I like to think of the elements. So, well, I know in certain cultures there's more than four elements, but I like to think of the basic four in my head that are earth, fire, water, and wind, right? And um, so those are kind of the, the basis. And I'll go off of that. I like to keep it practical. Um, I don't want it to be you know, something that gets really complex. Hopefully I didn't make it really complex with everything I just said, but I like that. I think that's more of just a mental space, you know, um, or a philosophy, I guess. So um, it really doesn't need to be super complex. I've done, you know, gardens for people over the past couple of weeks even, and it took two days to plant everything, get everything, put it in the ground, it's good. Um, well, okay, that was a week, but it could have took two days. It just with the spacing of time and, you know, things happen. And again, things happen. You plant plants, sometimes they don't want to live there. So sometimes they don't want to grow, you know, um, that's part of that communication, that relationship with plants. So um, let's see, we'll start with earth as, as the element that we'll start off with. Um, from earth, we have obviously the ground, the foundation. Um, and with that, I like to think of space, right? So understandably not everybody has a garden not everybody has a backyard not everyone has a yard um, to be growing certain things so I think that is something that I see a lot of information about over the internet like oh start a garden implying that I have like you know 300 square feet in my backyard actually I don't even know what 300 square feet the dimensions of that but it sounds like it's big um, but you know having this space of abundance um, and the first thing that comes to mind is like when I talk to people about this stuff in New York who may live in like, they don't like, they don't have a porch or a patio or anything like that, you know? Um, so starting with earth, I like to think of the foundation, the base, right? Where is our space? Um, do we have a yard? Do we have a back patio? Which reminds me, somebody did ask me about like patio gardening today and I have to get back to them. Or is somebody just growing in a smaller space like in their room on the windowsill, right? Um, so starting from there, if you're going to be, if you have the ability to grow into the ground directly, like I personally did that here because my roommate is also the landlord and he's into the same sort of stuff and wanted to put this into the ground. Um, but if you're renting out, obviously talking to your landlord and figuring out, is that okay to actually put it into the ground? Um, or do you want it to be, um, you know, separated like a raised bed because some landlords may not be super happy about the idea of that ground being something totally different within a year, right? Or within the season of growing stuff. So I think of that in terms of like its permanence, where is it gonna be? Um, and if you're gonna be doing directly into the ground, you have to start looking at the concepts of the layers of the soil, right? Like what sort of soil do you have? Um, you can get it tested with like local governments and figure out exactly if it's something that is going to be um, feasible to even grow in. We have in North Carolina something that's really popularly called Carolina clay, um, and it is like red clay. So very little things, well, things like to grow in it. I mean, you can see that like we have wildflowers and native things, um, but a lot of traditional crops that may be grown in this region may not do super well in it. So Carolina clay may not be the most ideal to try to directly plant things in. Um, you want a lot of organic matter, not a ton. You wouldn't want to be directly um, planting into compost. But a method that I follow with the garden over a long period of time is something called no-till. 
So a lot of farms will do something called tilling, which is, um, you can do it with by hand, but I have done it by hand for a while, excuse me, um, for a while and it's, it's a lot physically. So usually people take like mechanical um, tillers and they'll use those and it basically is these blades that turn up the ground and pull everything up so there's depth. Um, it's not compact like the clay is or any sort of soil if there's stone or anything like that. And then with that, you would add your material that may be soil, um, compost, anything like that topsoil, um, just really depending on the material, it varies. So that would be ideal with, um, sorry, I mentioned no-till. No-till is basically we wouldn't till. Um, so what, what I did when I first started the garden is we tilled the first year. The problem with tilling over and over each year is you start to break up a lot of um, organic matter and uh, microorganisms and bacteria that gets brought back up um, and it kills off that soil fertility and it compresses things over time. So in the long run, it's not as good for your crops. Um, and that in combination with monocropping, like monoculture, which is where you're growing one plant um, in a lot of you know larger agricultural scales is just really bad for the earth in general. So um, yeah, so basically looking at that, um, that is the foundation of, is it going to be in the ground? So is it going to be separate from the ground? If you were going to do that, you would just want something to block it. Um, usually inorganic material, uh, I guess you could do wood too, but I feel like I've never had a landlord get mad if something went through a raised bed, just barely into, you know, the ground, like you couldn't really tell if like a root went through and they're like, oh, there's one root that came through. Um, so I always think for that, and maybe the one that I recently made, it was a recycled materials made from recycled um, like plastic bottles. And it was just a sheet on the bottom. Um, we bought two by eight by eight pieces of woods. Sorry, two two by eight by eight pieces of woods of wood. And um, those are about eight feet wide or eight feet long. And there were two of them and then we got them cut in half so there were four feet long and with those we made our square our box right and then we got a couple smaller um two by fours and some small pieces to reinforce the corners we got nails um sorry not nails screws and like a pack of those was just a few bucks um and then drilling in to the side so basically um hold those together at the corner. Sorry, I'm like a visual person. I can see this all in my head. I know communicating, it comes off totally different. Um, but basically doing that will create a square raised bed of about four feet by four feet. Um, and that's a pretty good size. Usually this, the one I just did was three of those. Um, and doing that and creating that four by four bed, um, I want to say for those materials, just for the structure of it and that mat over the bottom was about $15. Um, so you can make a whole bed with $15 usually. Um, the only other thing after that is another part of the element of earth is your soil, right? So with your soil, it's it really varies. If you're local to Charlotte, um, you can get things or actually really anywhere if you have like a Lowe's or a Home Depot, although I tend to try to like not want to you know get from those big corporate places um we have a place here called atlantic landscape supply that has like a mycelium like a mushroom matter um, compost and garden blend and um yeah so that is something that i usually source from them it's something that i want to figure out to to ensure more accessibility because soil is something that can be very expensive um you know if you like, I don't have a truck and the delivery fee for them to deliver stuff is like $80, $90. So I've had to just borrow someone's truck um, and hope that I can get it and, you know, take all the things back and forth for about four truckloads, which you would probably need one truckload. Um, it's about, it's 35, it's about $40 for a truckload, um, just to kind of keep it in perspective of, of, of what that looks like. And um you can also get things from local counties, county, um, like the Mecklenburg County has a bunch of compost they have and it's $20 per load for a truck. Um, although with everything going on, it can be a little different. But if you're already at a place like Lowe's or at a hardware store getting the wood for these things, you can get bag soil there. 
um, that will spike up how much money you're spending because it can be about eight or nine dollars per bag of like one and a half cubic feet. And to fill up that bed, you usually need about two to two and a half. Um, so if we factor that in at about eight dollars, 16, like 20, we're about thirty five dollars, forty dollars with everything without the plants and the seeds and, and whatnot. Um, and this is something you could do in a day as long as you have all of the materials together. Um, so that would be raised bed. If you didn't have a raised bed in a yard and you only had a patio or a porch, um, you can be doing pots. So you can find pots usually if you look on Facebook or Instagram or anybody and looking at local groups of people who are growing um, plants or community gardens or anything like that. Um, then a lot of times you can find people who have pots. Like I have hundreds and hundreds of pots. PSA also, if you're in Charlotte, please take my pots, I have hundreds. Um, but sometimes it's hard to find pots, right? You can't just go, I mean, you can go to the store and buy some, but I'm, there's usually some lying around because they're usually only doing that until they go in the ground somewhere, if they are going in the ground and then they're just free. I found them like on the sides of roads, people just toss them out, a bunch of them, and I'm like, thanks. Um, but speaking of community gardens, that's also another good resource. If you can look around for a community garden, just look online, like whatever city you live in, community garden, see how close it is um, accessibility wise. Can you make it there? Um, let's see, is there a certain material for pots you suggest, plastic or terracotta? You could do like terracotta. I tend to find the terracotta ones or materials like that can be more expensive. Um, I've done plastic. All the stuff that I usually plant into is plastic. It's not going to live its life out there and start to like, you know, break down the plastic or anything, which I know is usually what goes through people's heads. Like, do I want plastic around my food um, or, you know, breaking down into it or anything of that sort. But I think they're not going to be there, you know, for years and years and years. So I, I've used plastic, but if you prefer terracotta and if it is a smaller scale thing, you can do um, on your porch or on your windowsill, then yeah, terracotta would be cool too. So um, community gardening is another one. If you have regular access going there, that's a big thing to think about. Um, I've been excited to do a community garden spot one time and I was like, oh, this is kind of like intense to go to, you know, it's like 25, 30 minutes to get over there. Um, so that is something to keep in mind if you're gonna do community gardening. Um, what can be upcycled to make pots? So I would say anything. Um, you could do mason jars. You could do a basket. Might, I don't know. Um, a key thing that you want to make sure that you have with a pot, given that the plant wants this, which it probably does, um, unless it's something that likes, likes what's called wet feet, which means it likes a lot of water. Um, you want to make sure there's holes and there's drainage, right? Um, if y'all have ever seen those five gallon buckets that you can get from hardware stores or even like they have a lot of bulk foods and restaurants usually toss them out. I'll take those, um, put a couple holes in the bottom and along the side so there's drainage and you can grow in those. And they have a handle and if something's going on, it's gonna frost, it's gonna get too hot, you can pull them and move them around, right? So that's a benefit of being, um, of growing in containers that you can do that. Um, I wish I could, I had like a slideshow of pictures of some of this stuff. I feel like that would help, but next time. Um, one thing that I did a few houses back is I did my whole garden on a patio. Um, and that was all container based. I repurposed, I had a canoe. There was a canoe for some reason um, in like the backyard that was decomposing. So I took the, the canoe um, and I filled it with soil and there was already cracks and a lot of holes in the bottom of it. So the drainage was good and I grew in the canoe. Um, you could do that. You could do, like I said, buckets. You could do literally a dresser drawer. You could do um, a storage box and you could drill holes in it. Anything that is, you know, a container containing something, make sure it has its drainage. Um, and, you know, ideally, I mean, you can do it if it's a bigger container, you have to think about like moving it or whatever if you're going to, but um, yeah. And also think about your space, right? You could use a giant bucket, but is a bucket something you're gonna be growing in your windowsill? Probably not. So um, let's see, where are we at? Soil, so yeah, soil is very depending on where you are. Um, the resources around you, excuse me. Um, I've found that another cool way to get um, soil 
relatively cheaper is if you go in bulk, maybe with a local company, like the landscaping one that I said, or um, pe yeah, people of that sort, maybe. Um, I think you could try to work in a deal. It just depends. I don't really foresee Lowe's doing like a bulk deal because they have people buying bulk all the time. Um, but if you were talking to, you know, different companies, local companies and saying, hey, me um, and nine other people want to, you know, have 15, 20 bucks for soil. I mean, 10 people, it's like $200. Then it's like, oh, it's a bulk order. And then maybe you can throw a little more, you will have enough. Um, maybe they'd be willing to deliver it too, right? So working in a communal way and seeing if everyone can put in to do that is really important um, and is a cool idea. So another part of earth would be the plants. Um, where are you getting your plants and your seeds, right? So right now, a lot of the plant and seed companies online are blown up. Like everybody wants plants, everybody wants to buy stuff. Um, my first recommendation, if you are getting it online and things will still arrive, um, is True Love Seeds. They're based in, um, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My friend Owen runs that and um, him and some other friends and their whole team are growing like really amazing crops. Um, and the concept is that the story is in the seeds. So these seeds have stories. There was one seed that was brought from I believe from Syria, from somebody's grandfather's freezer. And they were brought over, they germinated, and now they save that seed every year with that story behind it and grow it for the people who come from that culture. Um, so we, we connect in that way, especially with like cultural preservation um, and they're sourcing some seeds from us this year too. So True Love Seeds is, um, trueloveseeds.com is their website. Some other bigger ones that are pretty popular are Baker's Creek. Um, usually if you just type in Baker's Creek seed or sometimes they're Baker's Creek heirloom seed um, and Strictly Medicinal Seeds is also a company based out of Oregon um, and they do mostly a lot of medicinal herbs but they do also do vegetables as well. Uh, what is the difference between heirloom, organic, and regular seeds? So organic would basically determine or say that the generation that was grown to produce that seed was grown organically. Um, and there are some loopholes that a lot of um, cultivation can, can go through when it comes to organic. Like organic can technically mean, oh, we only use this much percentage of pesticide, um, which is weird. So um, that would basically be, organic means like it's growing organic. Um, heirloom would mean it's basically not been gone through this process of being um, cross-pollinated with anything or um, intentionally, you know, cultivated with another variety to create something else. It's, you know, like it's the original one. Um, and it's usually named something as somebody who kind of coined it as like, this is the whatever tomato, you know, before that it was just a tomato, but this one is purple and really big. So it's the blah, blah, blah tomato. Um, so I like to do usually heirloom um, seeds. And then regular seeds would kind of just be, you know, it's not organic. Um, I think like fairy morse and stuff like that, or um, what's that other one? Bonnie's would do things like that. It's just random um, seeds. And I think if that's what you have to work with, then do it. Um, and then you can go from there and start to cultivate it in a way that feels right with you, whether that's, you know, ideally just not spraying it with stuff, growing it in a really harmonious way, saving those seeds, which I'm not sure if y'all ever save seeds from something, but no matter what the plant is, you will have tons and tons more than you did the year before. So it's a really productive um, experience to save your own seed and really empowering because then next year, like all the people right now who are ordering and waiting three weeks for a shipment to get to them, they don't have to order seeds, right? So that's the difference between um, heirloom organic and regular seeds. So True Love Seeds, Baker's Creek heirloom seeds, and um, Strictly Medicinals are some good sources. Um, also look around, go on Facebook and on social media and look for the groups that are doing this stuff. In Charlotte, there's Grow Share Charlotte, um, I'm sure there's like three more and people just love to talk about plants. They say, hey, I have a bunch of this. Um, does anyone have any blah, blah, blah? People trade. Um, you can ask resources there. Does anyone have pots? Does anyone have extra seeds? Does anybody have anything? I know a lot of people who have gone on there as kind of like, I want to start a garden. I don't know where to start. And people give them all the resources. This is where you get your soil. This is where you can get it put in. 
I can put it in for you. People are like very willing to help. Um, they're plant people, so plant people are cool. So, um, oh, sorry. So, yeah, so getting your seeds is important. Um, and then you're gonna wanna start your seeds, right? So when you're growing your seeds, um, you ideally wanna make sure that you can tend to them pretty often, um, giving them water, giving them light. Actually, you know what, maybe I should. We'll start with, yeah, we'll go with earth. Now I'm going into different elements. We're still on earth. Um, basically starting our seed, uh, making sure we have good soil, um, again, having a good quality seed, whatever there's a seed that we want. Seeds are also very different. Um, I wish I could show you all. Oh, I kind of have some seeds somewhere. So yeah, some seeds are small like these. These are actually um, Szechuan pepper corn tree seeds. Um, and some of them are bigger. So when you're planting them, you're doing a little more in depth. Um, literally. So a good rule of thumb when you're planting seeds, whether in a little pot or direct into the ground, is that you don't want to go super deep so that they sprout and they can't get to light and then they die off. Usually like double the size of the seed is how, long, how deep you want to put it. Um, and then there's some that like to be surface sown where literally they just want a little bit of water and a little bit of soil put over them and that's that. Um, what's the best way to store the seeds if you save them? Uh, I like to say that you want to make sure if they're not totally dry when you're harvesting them, um, then let them go through the process in the sun. If you have a dehydrator, I wouldn't do like an oven because I've seen people do dehydrating if they don't have an actual dehydrator in an oven. Uh, but that temperature I think is too much because it can actually roast and like kill the seed. Um, so usually sun drying, drying it in something that's really, really low um low temperature i've even like squashes and stuff like that i've kept them on a plate or on a paper towel and then i'll kind of move them around so they don't mold or they don't you know um develop any sort of weird fungus on them um and then put them in a jar so you would think i have seeds every actually i do but it's in the closet of, of death back here where i have everything um but yeah, so storing seeds is just ideally away from the sun. Um, you don't want them to be in the heat. You don't want them to be in the cold. Although there are some plants that like the cold. So again, it just depends what you're growing. Um, but as a general rule, you want to keep them dry, away from sun, label them and know when you harvested them. Um, that's always important and it's been more important to me because I'm like, what is this? I can usually tell, but if they're in the same family, then you know, it kind of um, gets a little obscure. So yeah, so that's about what I would say with seed stick, seed storage. Um, and that I think kind of ties things off with the earth element as well. Um, and then on shorter notes, I would say the air element um, that would kind of go with space that would go with looking at where you're planting. Um, like wind is something that I'm starting to look at um, a little more significantly now because it's so windy in Charlotte all the time. Like today it was crazy windy. We've had like isolated tornadoes over the past month or two. Um, and wind can be a big problem if your plants are gonna get bigger, whether it's okra, whether it's a, a tree, anything like that. Um, and knowing like in permaculture, which is the study of basically like regenerative design of food cultivation and um, traditional methods, when you go out, you use all your senses where you are. Um, when you're looking at a space to grow in, right? You feel the wind, is the wind coming really crazy? Is, am I gonna plant something here and everything is gonna get wiped out? Um, what does the rain look like? Does the rain come down and accumulate here? So it's gonna be really moist and kind of not the best idea, you know, situation for plants. Um, so observing is really important. So I would say really just wind and the air um, and space would, would be good for like the air element. Um, and then for the sun element that, or sorry, fire element, which is the sun, um, we're looking at that, right? We're looking at warmth, we're looking at heat. Um, how many hours of sun are these plants getting? Uh, ideally, a plant likes like eight hours of sun a day. Full sun plant usually means like eight hours. Um, if it's like partial shade, it can be like six to eight or five to eight. I don't like to go under five hours of sun. Um, unless it is something that's like a native plant. So we have forests here where plants grow very specifically. Um, in the garden, we have this big mulberry tree and I plant the native plants under there and they get maybe like an hour or two of sun, very little sun. 
Um, so if you're growing something like that, that could be an idea like native plants. Um, but even in your windowsill, depending on what direction you're facing or on your patio, just making sure you're getting enough sun. I know a lot of places usually have big trees or big buildings near them and that can block out a majority of the sun. So you wanna keep that in mind. And also part of that observation, go out and be like, okay, how, you know, right now the sun is on my plants and it just got on because the shadow of my house just moved off of it. I'm gonna write down that time and then I'll wait until it starts to go away and I'll write down that time. What's, you know, what's the time between that? How many hours is that? Is that gonna be enough to grow X, Y, Z? And then another thing with fire is also, um, of course, heat. So not all plants, need heat as you can see in you know our northern climates things usually a lot of things die off or lose their leaves in the winter um, but there are a lot of winter crops that exist that we can grow throughout the winter whether it's broccoli um, brassicas which includes mustards kale cauliflower broccoli brussels sprouts something pea you know a bunch of stuff like that peas are a different family but peas um, things of that sort so that is another thing to keep in mind is that you know, what season of it can I just plant out now? Or this would be spring. Um, it's going to get a little cold in Charlotte this weekend, but after that, uh, we're in spring slash summer. And we know here, spring comes right before summer, and then summer hits us at 90 degrees all of a sudden. Um, so keeping that in mind, and if you're starting your seeds off, making sure they're staying warm, um, like little babies, like little chicks. So it's important. Um, and then the last element would be water right, which is really vital to most all plant growth. Um, there are some plants that really don't, and I think a lot of people who are growing stuff inside sometimes will tend to overwater, because you have to think the amount that you would water something that may be out in the garden full of sun all day, that's getting a little less, like a little bit of sun, um, enough sun, but not a ton in your windowsill is not gonna need as much water, right? Because it's not getting dried up as much, um, especially if it's indoors. So just making sure you're not overwatering. Plants will tend to tell you they're overwatering because they'll droop or um, usually that. They'll start to droop and they're like, uh, but they can also droop when they're, um, whatchamacallit, when they're too dry, right? If they're not getting enough water. Um, and you can usually tell because the, the soil is, you know, soaked or it's bone dry and you can like, crack pieces of the soil in the little container that it's in off and you can tell it's totally dry. Um, that's when you know it needs some help. And you can tell obviously the stem is gonna dry out, the leaves are gonna start to break off. Um, so it's important. So yeah, just water, making sure you're watering regularly. How are you watering? Um, if you're watering with a hose, like straight stream into the plant, um, think of, let me see. If I'm, that's not, I can't really think of a way to, to um, compare it, but you know, as a plant, I personally would not like to get my daily water uh, from a pressure washer. I would rather get maybe a sprinkle or, you know, some sort of like a mist, right? Um, but when you're misting, just make sure you're really watering because even though that top layer of the soil looks wet, the bottom is not. And the roots are what really want the water a lot of times. Um, so making sure you're watering enough, like a sprinkler system of something that's going to water really nice, but it's not going to, you know, whack plants around. Um, so the method of how you're, you're watering also is really important. So that's kind of the general questions or the <laughs> questions. I looked at the word questions, uh, the general um, elements and the concepts of starting your own garden, right? Um, there are a lot of ways to do it. You can do it in your house with little light. You can do it um, in an apartment with a balcony or a patio, you can do it in a yard, in the ground, you can do it in the yard, out of the ground, you can do it in buckets or pots or a bookshelf, I guess. Yeah, I think you could. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of possibilities. And I think also experimenting and trying it out and seeing is, is another really cool thing. Um, if you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, there is um, a woman named Erin Hostetler. She has, her company is called The Patio Farmer, and she does consultations. She helps you kind of determine things. Um, that's like her specialty. I I can talk on it, but it's not my specialty in the way that it's hers. Um, but if you're looking to do that personally, um, or you know, you're curious about some things, then feel free to ask. Um, my information, I'm sure, will be shared somewhere here. 
Um, but you can find me on Facebook on, under uh, Brandon Ruiz, or you can find the project, the CLT, Herbal Accessibility Project. And then most of the stuff that I do um, and make public and post about events and things like that is on Instagram. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions also, definitely. Um, but Instagram, um, at sign C-L-T-H-A-P uh, is where you can reach me best and get all of my, all the things about gardening, any questions you have, if you need to get seeds, I have an abundance of seeds I can share, uh, any resources. Let's see, in addition to actively listening to the plant, you also can actively listen to the soil to make sure you're giving it the correct amount of water. Exactly, right? So now you're talking to the earth, dirt, now people have even more of a reason to look at you weird because you're talking to the ground and the plants that come out of it. So, sounds fun to me. Um, yeah, that, that um, conversation is important, you know? And it doesn't happen a lot with um, the general world of food and plant cultivation. Um, what would I recommend people begin to grow now? I would say it depends on where you are. Um, what I like to do, especially with the project is I look at, you know, what are the culturally significant plants to you? Um, I think that it depends on your identity. It depends on what you want to grow. I really like to emphasize that. And also like, we can't grow everything. Like, I can't grow soursop trees or mango trees in North Carolina. Right. Um, but you can grow certain things. And I think it's, you know, just doing the research and figuring, excuse me, figuring it out. Um, but if you're growing some basic stuff here in, excuse me, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, we're about to have a weird frost this weekend. So I would hold off until about next week. Uh, but a good thing that you can do is you can start some of your early, well, we're kind of mid late spring. Um, so I would say now you could start your summer crops. You could be putting out okra, tomatoes. Um, you could be putting out, you could do your potatoes, sweet potatoes too, um, which is a cool process called making sweet potato slips that you can feel free to message me about. Um, you could do some lettuces like the heat and some don't. Um, kale and collards and things like that usually like spring and fall more than they do the intense heat of North Carolina. So I don't really recommend growing them right now, but um, just stuff that does like intense heat. We have Malabar spinach here, which grows really well in the summer. Um, it is really delicious and really nutritious. Um, yeah, you can also look at like the farmer's almanac for wherever you are. If you Google that, it will have a lot of advice for different things, when to plant them. We have radishes that we planted in January. So they've gone through frost and stuff. They're more acclimated to that environment, but we'll be harvesting them and starting our um, summer crop here. Peppers, tomatoes, squash, summer squash, planted winter squash in the midst of summer so that we get it later in the year. So a little bit of everything. Um, let me see, if you live in a place where there isn't a lot of sun, could you use light from a lamp? You could use light from a lamp, but it depends on what it is. So different lights, um, the bulbs are designed, you know, maybe they're not designed to actually have the right UV rays that may be similar to the sun. So plants may not register like a Himalayan salt lamp or like a, you know, ceiling lamp, uh, the same way that they would register the sun. But you could do things like grow lamps, which I think I have one. They, those can get a little expensive though. Um, they're big, actually bigger than that. The, the one I have is like four or five feet. Um, and you could set those up and keep them under there and they would grow well in that as well. Um, so I would say lamps, if you do, it would, I would make sure it's a grow light or a grow lamp because regular house lamps, I don't think would, would, um, be the best. It could be possible. Um, thoughts on creating a greenhouse. Yeah, you could create a greenhouse to just have a little longer season, um, I'm using a greenhouse that I was able to get access to with um, a local program and with a school. And so I, have, I didn't go through the process of creating that or anything like that. Um, you can do a very basic one, just having something that's glass, um, anything like that, that creates a room and that absorbs that heat through the day is gonna be a little bit warmer than the outside. So it could literally be this, this the frame of something with a door that's glass um, and that's like in the ground secure enough so it's not gonna blow over. Um, and you can put your plants in there. There's also the concept of uh, hoop houses, which are basically just like a net. And obviously it gets a lot 
hotter well not really as much hotter there it just takes less sun so it kind of mimics cooler environments to grow stuff like lettuce like in the summer or carrots or beets or things like that um, but you could create a greenhouse for sure if you keep something that doesn't exactly have like a, a heater running you could keep it close to the house or the building that has a little more heat to it and even through the evening time it can kind of create a little more um kind of a warmer environment for it somewhat so yeah, I think there's some cool possibilities. You could also, for germination, just a little random trick, um, if you have like a plastic Tupperware, you can poke some holes in it and just cover over and that humidity that it um, creates is basically something that is really hospitable for things to germinate and things of that sort. Um, talk about a project with the league, if you missed it. Yeah, so um, with the league, basically I'm working on a couple things and navigating them through everything going on. Um, but the main thing is I'm working on the um, garden that is, it's like a cultural garden of sorts. Um, and it's basically in the Lakeview community on the west side of Charlotte. And um, we're growing out of the beds that they've had that they haven't really, um, that hasn't been utilized for this year because we're going to be growing some different things in it. So I'm basically going to be working on growing some stuff that the community wants to see grown that kind of connotates towards traditional dishes of the community members, um, the cultures and identities of the community members. And yeah, that's kind of the main part. And then I'm also working on a zine or like a small book of sorts, interviewing, um, individuals, families from different parts of the world who now reside in Charlotte, North Carolina, who are growing their traditional crops um, and talking about their stories, things that they grow, a traditional dish behind it. Um, there are a lot of really amazing people who are growing stuff here that would not come out as like, oh, I'm a herbalist, I'm a farmer, and this and that. It's just, I'm growing X, Y, Z up the street for me, the, the street over. Um, there's a Vietnamese family who grows sweet potatoes, taro root, ginger, turmeric, persimmon, bitter melons, like everything. Um, and so I think getting into that sort of um, that space of a relationship with plants in a way that they have taken with them across the world um, is really important to me. And I want to highlight that in the zine. So that'll exist at some point soon. So yeah, and any other questions, like I said, y'all can reach out to me or even comment it on here and I can come back and, and answer some things if you're watching this already recorded. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching and I'll be back on, um, I know there's a couple other community conversations with the Charlotte chapter over the next couple of weeks. And my next one is on the 20th, I believe. And I can't remember which one it is, it's food sovereignty or the at-home herbal medicine, um, but they're both gonna be great. So you should tune into whichever one, so. Thanks for watching.